Hi everyone, it's Paloma, a community manager at CFT. We're live today from our London office. And thank you so much for joining us from all different parts of the world. Um, and welcome. Um, so this is the second episode of our FinTech Update series. And today we're delighted to have um, Gillian Cripps, who is our advisory board member and uh, an executive coach at LBS, as well as the founder of Credo Consulting. Gillian has a lot of experience coaching senior, dif uh, senior leaders from uh, different countries. And I really hope you learn a lot from today and you find this helpful and insightful. Um, she will be um, interviewed by Traman, our co-founder, um, who will moderate the discussion. Um, so yeah, I really hope you, you enjoy it. And remember that if you have any questions, um, you can just uh, type them on the, on the platform. So we make sure that Gillian uh, can address them. Um, so yeah, let me um, welcome Gillian and Roman here. So, so we start. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very delighted to uh, welcome Gillian this afternoon. Uh, I'm Chamang, I'm the co-founder of CFT, and uh, we're having today a very large uh, audience uh, coming and listening to Gillian. Um, I would like to also welcome um, uh, Puya Shamshidia uh, from London, who was also uh, a winner, part of the AI Awards, who came uh, to visit us as a child and participate to, the, to this webinar as well. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a real pleasure because I've met Jilan a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, and uh, for us, you are um, a wonderful coach. And uh, I'm very, I feel very privileged uh, to, to have you here today. Um, I, to start, um, I would like this webinar to be very engaging and I welcome you to, to have questions and feel, don't hesitate to ask as many questions uh, as you want. I will try to, uh, to, answer, to get the questions to Gillian. But first my question, um, can you share a little bit about your journey and mm. your, your background? Mm and uh, how you come to being an amazing coach today. Oh, well, it's very kind of you, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, so my journey to being a coach was um, quite, quite an interesting one because um, I've been coaching since 2003. Um, and really, the, the, the starting point for being a coach for me was a change of career because I'd been a journalist for 16 years. I'd been management editor on the Financial Times. Um, and I'd, I'd been a, a journalist, as I said, for a, quite a long time. Um, so what I would do, I would interview CEOs. I would um, write and commission articles about what was happening in the business world, what was changing, um, strategic decisions, mm -hmm. mergers and acquisitions that the people cite behind what was going on in the headlines. Um, but it, it occurred to me more and more that I was actually just reporting on what was happening rather than being engaged. So uh, the big shift for me was to start being engaged with business. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to go a little bit deeper. Um, I was lucky to have two professors who, um, who wrote for me, and they, they wrote about coaching um, in the paper quite a lot. And for me, it, it, it was a very interesting subject and um, how um, leaders would really benefit from having the space and time to mm -hmm. go and um, share their challenges, talk about how they would approach things, develop strategies. Um, and it got me very interested. So I, I decided to take a sabbatical. I took um, a master's degree at, at London University, studying organizational psychology and also um, coaching. Um, so since then, I've, I've been working at London Business School and also doing my own, own coaching. But I had, did form a little startup, I suppose, of my own, which is my own company. I'm very impressed. I'm very, very impressed. Mm. Um, role as a coach and mm. um, you know, we, we, have, um, we have a lot of people who has been asking us about what is actually the role of, a heavy, uh, of being a coach. And I will, I'm very curious because you, you meet so many interesting people and what are the types of profile that you've been coaching? Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to hear your experience. Um, and my last question is that, does anyone need a coach? Right. Um, <clears throat> 
I I work in the sphere of executive and business coaching um, rather than life coaching, which is a completely separate um, um, industry and sector. So the, I, I tend to work with leaders um, and managers. Um, so, I, well, actually everybody. I, I can work from everybody, from CEO and board member, um, on their strategic challenges, on their... Um, their operational challenges, mm -hmm. um, driving through change initiatives, you know, for the very high level things, mm -hmm. um, all the way to new graduates mm -hmm. and MBA students. Um, so I, I find myself often coaching people at a point of transition. And what I mean by that is um, a transition can be moving to a new job, a bigger job with more responsibility, a greater team, mm -hmm. or it could be um, switching function. Mm -hmm. Or it could be um, coming back to work, say, as a mother who's returning after having a family. Um, so transitions are interesting because, it, to me, I'd say that's my niche because that's where people have to really think about how to reinvent themselves, how to, how to stretch, how to come out of, perhaps, um, their comfort zone, mm -hmm. I would say. So there's a lot of psychology in this. There's a lot of um, thinking about how you manage yourself mm -hmm. as well as how you you manage others. So do you have any any example of uh, yes. fascinating and unconventional uh, career uh, people that you've been coaching that yes. you would love to share with us? Well, three three people come to mind, really. Um, one was um, an MBA student who actually came from the Middle East, very interesting. And he was 30 years old. And we always ask people why they're doing an MBA. And he said, because um, I'm trying to define what my third career will be. Um, and I said, well, you're 30 years old and you're, you're thinking about your third career. So he, he told me he'd done a startup. He told me he'd, uh, he'd worked for an, uh, um, a large organization. Then he'd done a startup. And he was actually now searching for something to do um, mm. for the next part of his life. So I thought that was very interesting. Yes. Um, Somebody I've been coaching this year with a tech company, actually, a big US tech company based in London, mm -hmm. um, has actually seen three organizational restructurings during the course of this year. So that's been very challenging for him. He's mm -hmm. been operating in the, um, the fitness space, so the, the fitness and wearable devices, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, and he's had to really think about how to... Um, <clears throat> Re, so reconfigure his skills, um, learn how to deal with organizational politics, learn how to deal with the fact that one day you come in and have one job and the next day it's, the team's gone, a new team's arrived, you've got a new role. So I thought he, he was, that was a very interesting set of challenges. And of course, there are those who, <clears throat> um, there are those who really want to um, leave a large organization Mm -hmm. and start up their own business. And, and for them, it, it's, it's a very challenging um, set of things they have to do. They have to move from the structure of a large organization, the day-to-day -day certainty in some respects of what they're doing. Um, and they have to really think about how to pitch, how to draw up a business plan, how to set up a website, all of these things, how to organize themselves. Um, so those those are just three of the, of the people I've been working with. That's very, very events. interesting. No, that's very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Which leads me to the next question, which is any advice of how to identify a good coach? You've mm. been coaching, and I know that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's probably, uh, we're, we are very lucky to know you, but now, you know, probably people around are also looking for coach. What kind of advice would you give for someone who are looking uh, for a good coach? And what other questions they should ask, you know, uh, themselves um, to, uh, to, to look for the coach? And how uh, to take the most benefit as a coachee, the relationship between the mm. coachee and the coach? Yeah. Well, I, I would say um, really what coaching is, and there's a lot of confusion between coaching and mentoring, but mm -hmm. which perhaps I'll address at the beginning. Yes, please. Coaching is working with somebody who's trained, usually trained, um, to create some space and time to think about a challenge that they're facing, mm -hmm. to, to be able to get a perspective on not just the issue, but on themselves. Mm -hmm. 
So it's usually conducted away from the office and in its it, it's really the coach acts as a sort of sounding board for their ideas. The coach should draw out the answers from them rather than providing advice. So it's not a consultancy role. It's, mm -hmm. it's really giving people the space and time to think. Um, a mentor is, is quite different because a mentor is usually somebody who helps you, um, who gives you advice, mm -hmm. helps you manage your career. I know in the, the tech world and startup world, it's really good to have a mentor yes. who will tell you how to do things to... <clears throat> so you don't make the typical mistakes. So somebody who's watching your back, giving you advice, helping you really um, avoid the, the, the crazy quest, the crazy problems, the, the holes that you might fall into. In a large organization, it's often about helping people navigate their careers, so giving advice on politics, you know, who to develop as your sponsors, who, who to avoid. Um, advice for people on <clears throat> having a coach. I'd say be really clear about what you want to get out of the relationship. So what are your objectives? What do you want to um, work on? And really own the agenda because the agenda really is yours. It's not the coaches. Mm -hmm. it's, it's for you to bring to the sessions what's important to you, um, what you want to cover. And, and make sure that you test your coach. The questions you could ask them, you know, I'd ask them about how qualified they are. I'd ask them about their experience. I'd ask them about how they like to work. But you must be very clear about how you want to work and to really own the agenda. So I always make sure that for each session I work with people, they bring their objectives and we work, we work to that. Um, having said all that, <clears throat> I do think there are many more coaches around us than we realize. So quite often, um, our friends, our family, can actually act as, as good coaches. What you need is somebody who's aware that they can be objective, they can challenge you, and they can ask the right questions. Um, so you don't want a friend who's telling you what you want to hear, you don't want somebody who's just giving you advice mm -hmm. without listening. Um, so I, I, often, I often get to the point where I ask somebody a question in my coaching sessions, and they say either my mother keeps asking me that or my <laughs> wife or my husband. And then I never really get the spot because, um, you know, you'd be surprised how many people are around you as long as they can challenge you and remain objective. And as a piece of advice, um, tell them, tell these informal coaches never to give you advice. You know, mm. what you want is questions and space to think. It's very interesting. Mm. You know, we talk to young graduates <clears throat> who also yes. um, experienced professionals. And the world that is coming to, to them is a certainty. There mm. are so many things taking place with this new tr uh, disruption that is mm. taking place, notably in finance with technology. Mm. And so it's very hard for them to predict what's going to be their future career. Mm. Um, and because of, the, of all of these changes with artificial intelligence and, and new business model, like Airbnb or Fiverr, what are the big trends that you foresee in the future? Mm. For the world of business, yes. uh, for young graduates. Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, for, for, for professionals as well, uh -huh. the people that you coach, what do you foresee in terms of trends? Yeah, I think <clears throat> obviously globalization is a big trend, that the mm -hmm. world is becoming um, more um, homogeneous, mm -hmm. it's becoming closer, it's more economies are more interlinked. Mm -hmm. um, that means... You know, we're all saying the same thing. We're all often speaking English. Um, um, cultures, individual cultures are becoming less relevant, I'd, I'd say, in some mm -hmm. ways. They're becoming less of an issue. It's a big global marketplace. <clears throat> so I think having a global mindset is, is very important. I think mobility is very important. The way that people, particularly millennials, um, like to work wherever they want to work. So, you know, that could be a city, it could be um, from a coffee shop, it could be on their phone, it could be, you know, in many, many different ways. So mobility. Um, work, I would say now, is not a destination. It, it's, it, work has always been something you do, but mm -hmm. for many people it's been a destination. It's, the, it's where you go to. Mm -hmm. um, now it, it's really mobile. It's doing, it, it's in your pocket. It's, mm -hmm. it's what you're doing around doing other things sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I think that mobility is important. Um, millennials, I think they're going to have a huge um, influence on the workplace. They, you know, they're the digital natives now. They're, they're going to be dictating really and challenging how the organizations work. I was reading an article which said that um, <clears throat> actually 
Um, we've got technology of the 21st century, but we're, the offices are constructed for the way we worked in the 1970s. Yes. You, know, you go there, you sit there all day, you come home. Um, That's very true. So I think <clears throat> millennials will be driving <clears throat> a lot of change about how they want to work, more informality, um, and actually more, more of a sense of say. They want to be involved and engaged. Um, technology clearly is going to be a huge, huge, huge impact. Um, you know, huge. I think it's the disruptor, really, isn't it? The way we work, the way you know, the devices we work on. Um, and another thing is is how open we all are, how public we are with our lives, um, with Twitter, with LinkedIn, with Facebook. You know, people share a lot more. So I think those would be the five trends that I, I see coming. <laughs> you know, we 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 spend quite quite a lot of time with the program of artificial intelligence yes. in in finance, <clears throat> and the question that we ask all our experts mm. are very much with the relationship with the people. Mm. So, do you think I'm asking you the same? Do you think that robots and automation will replace mm. humans? <clears throat> do you see a future where many of us will have to compete with artificial intelligence? Mm. What, what do you think? Well, um, I think it was Stephen Hawking who famously said that um, that um, robots will replace humans. Um, he had concerns that robots will replace humans. And I think he, what he was meaning by that was that if we program them really well, they could actually um, exceed us in their thinking. Um, they could... Um, particularly if their goals weren't aligned with our goals, we, we, we could have a, an ethical dilemma here. Um, and Jack Ma also talked about, um, you know, lots of jobs disappearing because of robots. Um, but I think we have to be really clear about this because uh, um, robots are really good at doing kind of work that people will probably find very boring and repetitive. They, they, they don't get bored with repetitive work. Um, and, you know, the more the more we can think about robots and robotics as, as things that can really support us and can actually complement us in our work, the better, because um, we will be working alongside them. We are working alongside them. I, I take two industries, for example. We have uh, the automotive industry and medicine. Medicine's not an industry, but um, in, the automotive industry has been working with robotics for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not new. And what, what I think has happened is that people's jobs have become more interesting as a result. They've yes. become more complex. And, and they're monitoring the robots. So I think that's, <clears throat> that's one interesting industry. With medicine and doctors, particularly surgeons, they're finding they can be a lot more precise. They can be a lot more um, focused with, with robotics. Um, and we can work remotely, which is an amazing um, evolution. So I, I don't buy into this, this business of robots replacing us. I think artificial intelligence, you know, it, it is programmed by us. And we have the sort of creative thinking that can take us, that can take it forward. Um, we do have to be ethical about it, though, as well. That's, that's the really important thing. Yeah. No, I totally mm -hmm. share the same with mm -hmm. you. And I think more and more of the people i think need to understand artificial intelligence because i feel that it's 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 like when you were having um, the internet mm -hmm. and it's like having excel and being mm -hmm. in finance you need mm -hmm. to understand how to use excel mm -hmm. so now artificial intelligence is entering the world of finance yeah. and i will borrow um, one one example from uh, ken wood from ocbc and he said it's like artificial intelligence is a friend mm -hmm. it's like you're having you used to do Absolutely. your coffee you Absolutely. know with the powder yes. you know and then mm -hmm. suddenly there's a very nice nespresso machine which is the uh -huh. artificial intelligence tool mm -hmm. that is allowing you to actually do better coffee more efficiently very nicer you know customer experience mm -hmm. you need to use it because it will make your life much easier yeah. Yeah. so yes artificial intelligence i think it's a very good uh, tool uh, that will change a lot of the the, the the way that we do finance or access finance yeah. it's inter it's very very important yeah. to consider that as a, as, as a friend more than as, an, a, as a replacement. A I really that. like, so I thought mm -hmm. I would share it online. Um, at, um, at CFT, we strongly believe in, in, on, um, in people and investing <coughs> into knowledge. And it's, it's very important to, to, to our personal and business growth. Do you think that this mm -hmm. is the only way? 
that uh, we can thrive today? Um, and, uh, and that's my first question. What do you mm -hmm. think? The only way we can thrive is through learning. You think? Yes, I fully, I fully agree with that. Um, we we've been talking since the 1990s about a checkerboard career, mm. which is um, a career where you can move upwards, but also downwards and sideways. And the key to a long career is making sure that you're skilled and you upskill. You keep mm. you keep adding to your skills. So, I think. <clears throat> excuse me. I think. Um, that, that learning is always the best investment. Um, and nowadays, it's, it's not, I, I would say it's not just the learning about your specific knowledge um, for whatever job you're doing. It's not just that deep vertical knowledge, mm -hmm. but you have to learn more of lateral knowledge as well, which is around, um, you know, what do other roles do? What do other functions do? But also your management, your leadership skills, your emotional intelligence, your communication skills, collaboration skills, all of these are really important. And it's often assumed in business that people have these automatically, but, but they don't. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm fully behind you. I mean, learning, I'm amazed sometimes by the number of people who are very senior jobs, who are really are poor communicators, <laughs> or they just don't have emotional intelligence skills or the collaboration skills, even at board level. Can, can be sometimes astonishing. So um, the fact that they're lacking, rather. Yeah. I fully agree with you. And I would like to ask mm. the audience if uh, we're having questions for you. Mm -hmm. I have lots of other questions, but I'd like to maybe get, we have Samuel from Paris, who is asking you, Gillian, what is the first and simplest step someone can mm -hmm. take today mm -hmm. to better mm -hmm. prepare themselves for digitalization? Um, do you mean, Samuel, that the um, an individual can take? Yes, yes, rather than organization. Yes. Um, well, I would say that I would look to Tramann and say yes. that her, her <laughs> courses um, here at CFTE on, um, on um, artificial intelligence and fintech uh, are, really, are really good if you want to learn the knowledge. But um, by digitization, I, I suppose you mean being able to operate in the digital world. Um, so... We talked a little bit, um, um, I've been thinking a little bit about coding is, is, is an important skill. Um, so for any of us who are, I mean, I should probably do this myself, but anybody who's, who's concerned about, you know, their job um, evolving, becoming, you know, more digitally focused, um, it wouldn't hurt to, to learn some coding. It, it can be either a springboard to a new career or you can reinvent yourself. Um, I think I think one, one of the interesting things about coding is it can teach you um, how to collaborate. You have to learn somebody else's language. You have to be a little, very good on um, keeping, sort of being focused and having um, very, very good um, eyes, an eye for detail, which I think is really important. Um, so I would say those three things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have Troy uh, from mm -hmm. South Africa mm -hmm. who is asking, as a professional coach, what do you see as being the key competencies that a business leader, entrepreneur must have in the disruptive fintech sector? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Hello, Troy. Um, well, um, I'm looking to and fro yeah, at, uh, is, yeah. at, the, um, at the question. So a leader or an entrepreneur um, in fintech. Um, what's interesting about leaders in large organizations or if, we, if we're looking at, at banks particularly, um, let me start with leaders in banks. What I often see is a lack of preparedness and a lack of understanding mm -hmm. about fintech. So for them, um, I would definitely say start to understand this world of um, fintech. Start to understand that, you know, the the days of the the boardroom where people can disappear and have closet, you know, closed conversations are probably over. You need to really be able to engage with um, a wider range of of um, your constituents, particularly millennials. I would say. Learn from them. Find yourself a coach who's a millennial. 
Um, that's reverse coaching. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, one bank, I think, um, I can't remember which bank, but they, they had a mentoring program where um, young graduates actually mentor the board. So that, that's really good to have. That's happening in some banks. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of an entrepreneur, well, I guess um, it would depend on the sector you're in. But if you're, you know, if you've got your own website, if you've got customers, if you're working online with people, you really do have to learn the skills of, um, of um, fintech. I mean, you, you, you do have to be able to hold your own to be able to speak the new language. Mm -hmm. I often think that um, fintech, prop tech, all of these new, you know, emergent um, aspects of the sector, it is like learning a new language. It is being able to converse with the right, um, using the right words and, um, you know, finding your community as well, you know, finding who can help you, who can support you. Okay. Do we have other questions? Yes, it's coming. So we have Jega from Singapore. So we're living in um, so much disruptive world. What must have soft and hard skills make us to thrive in this environment in delivering value to self, mm. company, and society to people mm. in need? Mm. That's a great That's question, a good question. Uh, Jega. Thank you. Um, I like the way uh, change has become disruption because it, it's true that we, we've had a lot of change. I mean, I think a lot of people feel that we've only had change in the last 10 years since the economic the financial crisis. But in fact, there have been many changes over the last um, 20, 30 years, certainly since I started in the workforce 30 years ago, that you know, there many, many changes and disruptions. I think the difference now is that it's faster, it's more complex, and it's it's um, a lot of it is technology driven and globalization driven. Um, so when it comes to the hard skills, um, I would say your hard skills are in the realm of the work you are doing. So whatever whatever it is. So I have my training chairman as a banker. Um, you'll be doing, you know, maybe you may work in public service, you may work in um, a, a, a commercial organization, but it's your knowledge, it's what you know, it, it's what you're bringing, your, your deep knowledge, your tacit knowledge of your job. Um, and then on top of that, I say the technological skills that will prepare you for, you know, if your job does evolve, if, if, if technology does start to change the way the organization is structured or the market changes or the industry changes. Um, in terms of soft skills, um, as I said earlier, it, it, it comes down to um, the really basic things about, I'd say about having really good values is, is really important. So knowing who you are, knowing what your values are, knowing how to treat people respectfully, know how to engage with people. From that comes good communication skills, being able to be clear about how you speak and what you're saying. Um, emotional intelligence, so you can understand the other's perspective, you can engage with them and you can listen. Uh, the other part of communication is listening, really listening to understand. Um, and I think another one which, which sort of feeds into all this is, is the leadership skills in, in terms of, you know, how are you influencing people? How are you motivating them? How are you managing and leading so that you keep everything on track? You know, everything's, you know, with a lot of change, a lot of things can get very unstable. So how do, you know, how does the leader and manager keep everything on track, keep people motivated and inspired? keep the business running the operational and strategic goals uh, clear. Um, and, you know, it's not something that you can um, do overnight. Mm -hmm. But I, I would just find, add to that, you know, give yourself a bit of reflection time so that you can really reflect and think on how, mm -hmm. how you're leading and managing in whatever role you're doing or how you're delivering if, you, if you're just, if you're an individual contributor. Really what, and, and, you know what you need to do and and how you need to present the best your best face to the world yeah yes we have one more question and this is from alok the use of tech in finance is not new 
we saw the area of automated telemachines, but now it's almost at an end. So how long of an age do you see for finance 2.0? Wow, that's a lot. Thank you. That's a challenging <laughs> question, which I might turn over to Tram Ann, who's uh, much more in this field. Um, I don't know is the answer to that. Um, yeah, I really, I would, if you're talking about um, finance 2.0, if I understand this correctly, finance 2.0 is the more automated finance. It, it does it include fintech, or is that finance 3.0? That's that's where I would finance 2.0 is very fast, where technology has a great impact yeah. on finance. Yeah, where fintech is coming as well, with okay. people having now access to yeah. finance thanks to technology yeah and uh, and and today i think uh, it, it has a huge impact mm -hmm. because when we were entering the world of finance when i started in finance it was let's say technology was not the main focus you mm -hmm. were just entering the world yeah. of finance and you have new products so yeah. it was an area where there was the rise of the derivative words i started on the trading floor and it was with uh, the the, the non-deliverable forwards which was sophisticated uh, fx product that was mm -hmm. just coming and how do we make sure that those products could mm -hmm. come to the market mm -hmm. um, that today i think that the world is totally changing in finance because I think technology is much cheaper than before yeah. and things are very much now with the use of technology has a huge impact on finance mm -hmm. and you have uh, and a lot of other places around the world that now can use technology to allow people yeah. to get access to finance. Yeah. Forgive me, I, I thought finance, we were on finance 3.0, yes, but yes, yes. Um, maybe that's coming in the future, yes, but yes. If, if it's from the automated tellers to where we yes. are now, how long how long an age do we see for finance? I mean, I think it, it's indefinite. It's indefinite. <laughs> it's indefinite. Uh, what, what is going to be interesting is when the large buildings I see from out of this window in the Shard exactly. are replaced by exactly. um, mobile phones, um, links perhaps, distributed, you know, working populations. Um, so I, I would say, well, if, if I look at it that way, I'd say maybe we're not that far along, are we, actually? Because there's a huge, huge way to go in terms of uh, moving from these huge, great monolithic buildings um, to a really um, um, a technological organization, which is um, probably what Amazon is now. Exactly. Amazon, um, um, whether it's, you know, Spotify, all of these organizations, it's... So I think we've got some way to go. Um, maybe I've invented the term three, finance 3.0. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'll, if you had to share just one life lesson, mm -hmm. uh, what would it be? Was there a single mistake that you made that really shaped uh, the, the, your work? Mm. Um, I think there's two questions perhaps in there. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest... I think my biggest life lesson, which is one I learned when I was very young, um, was how important it is to keep challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. So challenging yourself teaches resilience. And I think if, if you can make a point in life of choosing things that are outside your comfort zone, if you can choose things to do that you're not your best at, but you're curious, you're curious about, and they stretch you. And if you can kind of learn that you will fall over, you will make a mistake, it will go wrong, but get back up again. Mm -hmm. You're learning the skills of resilience, mm -hmm. of flexibility, of um, this ability to, to kind of pick yourself up and get going again. So. That, that would be my life lesson. Um, in terms of a mistake, I, I, I say this to all of the young people who are starting out on their careers. Um, I thought I made the biggest mistake of my life when I took a job in um, a professional services company just after graduating. And all my family told me it was the wrong thing to do. I was terrible with numbers. I couldn't possibly do it. And I ignored them. And 
anyway, they were completely right. And I, it was hopeless. It was terrible. And I thought it, that mistake was really the end of the world. Whereas, in fact, it was the beginning of learning mm -hmm. about what I was not good at and what I didn't want to do. And sometimes the way to chart your career is, is just to find out what you don't want to do, what, what's not you, and experiment, you know, make mistakes. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> do you have any, any other questions? Otherwise, I have two more questions, but mm -hmm. uh, I'd like also uh, from Andrew. You've worked with elite leaders and experts. Which qualities separate them from others in the industry? Mm. That's a very good That's question. That's a great question. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I would say that the thing that distinguishes um, really good leaders is their, their um, ability to be themselves. Um, and that sounds like a very simple thing to do, but in fact, it's one of the hardest things to do in life, particularly when you're heading up a big organization, when there are a lot of expectations of who you should be. A lot of people project onto you, you should be this, you should be that. Um, so good leaders know themselves um, and they show themselves and they're skilled in that. So if I'm a if I'm really extrovert and like to do all the talking, it's I have to be skilled in that. It's a good quality, but it it you have to be skilled too. Um, they're also not afraid to be vulnerable, so they can show their weaknesses. So we have some allowable weaknesses mm -hmm. because that gives others the opportunity to help them. And leadership really is all about engaging people, motivating, inspiring them. So I think those who can be be themselves, be very grounded, be connected with people and inspire people to follow them and give them something to do to show that they can make a contribution. Those tend to be the best leaders in my experience. Thanks, Julian. Mm. I think I see another one, which is from Premal from India. Many of those you coach are senior experts in the field. How do you approach advising people who may have more personal industry experience than you? Thank you, Pramal. Um, one of the things about coaching is that it's not advising. So I never get into the situation where I advise people. Um, that said, um, my role is to structure a conversation so it helps the person I'm coaching to think through their challenges. So my role really is to structure and provide a space for that thinking. So I rely on psychology, I rely on um, experience, um, I rely on understanding the challenges that people face across all industries, you know, across all industries, um, whether it's a strategic challenge or an operational challenge or um, a, a conflict challenge or a personal um, development challenge. There is there's many, many ways to approach it. it it's, it's about finding out how that person's thinking about the problem, what they've tried, what they haven't tried, mm -hmm. and, and really helping them to find the courage to either act differently or to, to, to seek expert advice or to find a way, to find a way through it. Um, so it, it, it's a curious, it's a curious dynamic and, um, uh, one of one of the best examples I have of this is with actually Hui, um, Traman's husband, the founder of, of CFTE, who was talking, um, I coached him as a banker and also when um, he was transitioning to doing more fintech. And I remember regularly saying to him, Hui, I really don't know what you're talking about. And uh, <laughs> please. But he said, no, no, it's the structure. It's the way... Um, the way you're helping me think that's important. So, so that's that's the way I would approach it. Um, and we start as coaches from the premise that each person actually has the right answer in them, mm -hmm. and our job is to draw that out. So, you know, Traman, you know your team, you know your business, you know your your um, your business much much better than I do. So, in reality, you've got you've got the answer to whatever challenge you're facing, and it's not me. 
And I think it's important sometimes, and it's very important mm -hmm. to have people like a coach to trigger that moment, Absolutely. to yes. help you to, even though I know my business well, I know my team yeah. well, yeah. it's important sometimes to have coach like yourself to trigger that moment mm -hmm. that to give you a little bit of mm -hmm. step you step mm -hmm. back a little bit of your business yeah. and you ask you to help to question yeah and that's yeah. very important yes so that's questioning yourself exactly can be very important exactly too. yes mm -hmm. um and i won't say finally because i have another question but do we have any no so i have what advice would you give to those entering the workforce today mm. <clears throat> Gosh, um, <clears throat> well, I would say that um, the the world of work today is very different from when I started many years ago. <laughs> I won't say how many, but many years ago. Um, one of the big differences that you've got, it's very fragmented mm. nowadays, and you've got many, many more options, mm. um, which we didn't have. Uh, maybe you didn't, Tremaine, when you were graduating as well. Um, now, that's a fantastic thing in many ways, but it's also um, a big challenge because mm. it puts more responsibility on you to actually get things right. Mm. Um, so people, I think young people entering the workforce now feel um, under quite a lot of pressure. And they're under a lot of pressure to not just be successful in their career and quickly, but to be really happy as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a really difficult balancing act, I mm -hmm. would say. Um, because my expectation was that you work, you did a good job, and you know, if you're happy, you're happy. So I think you, young people entering the workforce now are under a lot of pressure. So I would say take some of that pressure off yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you, never, you, you can never plan a perfect career you can only work with the opportunities that you've got. And opportunities are quite random. So you have to seek opportunities, but you don't get everything yeah. that you want. But take them, be, be bold, um, don't be afraid to make mistakes, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to challenge yourself. Keep skilling up, keep making sure that you know, you know you're learning. Learning, learning, learning all the time, on the job, outside courses. Um, and take a risk sometimes. Sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. Um, it, it all sounds a little bit uncertain, a little bit difficult. And I think when people ask me about planning careers, I say really only two kinds of people kind of can plan the career. And, and they're probably people with vocations. So either in medicine, mm -hmm. typically, or if you're going to join the church or religion, you know, you know where you're going. But the, the years of having a structured career are over. Um, I would say, just think about um, your career won't make sense going forward, but there will be a point where it makes sense looking backwards. And I think that's also the beauty of life because it doesn't make sense going forwards <laughs> often. But when you look back on your life, you can see the patterns. So I think trust, hope, being optimistic as well and putting your best foot forward and being yourself. You're very again. good advice. I agree. Totally agree mm -hmm. with you. And my last question, if you were 18 today mm. um, and you had a little bit of money uh, in, your, in, in the bank, what would you do? Mm, good question. Um, of course, I would take your courses here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I really would. I really do mean that. Um, and um, I, I would learn about fintech. I would learn about artificial intelligence. Um, uh, a client of mine just told me she's doing a master's in human and computer interactions. So maybe if the money stretched to that, I might be interested in that too. Um, I'd say um, travel if you can. Oh, yes. Yeah, particularly to Asia, see what's happening over there. Mm. Um, I don't think I've got much money left now. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you have one more, a little uh -huh. bit more. And that's mm -hmm. my last question before we end. Mm -hmm. I love books. I know you love books too. Mm -hmm. So with a little bit money that is like, what kind of books would you advise us to read? Because mm -hmm. I know you're a big fan of and big reader too. Yes, actually, there was a, a great book that came out recently by Linda Gratton, who's professor of management practice at London Business School. Oh. So keeping it on a business focus. Um, she wrote a book um, with a colleague called The 100-Year Life. And it's a really challenging book because it says... 
that as we're all living older, we have to rethink our careers because we can't work for 35 years and expect to provide for 40 years of retirement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you look after your health? How do you plan your career? How do you keep staying fresh and relevant? Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you manage yourself financially, you know, economically, in terms of skills mm -hmm. in your, your career? I think that's a really, really interesting it's book very to read. Interesting um, book. Because that's that may be that may be not me, not my generation, but maybe you know millennials can really look forward to having that hundred year life. Okay. Um, and I, I would I'd recommend that. Other than that, the other final thing I'd say is make sure you you read three or four books a year as a minimum, maybe five, maybe five or six, um, because you know people who read literature understand the human condition. Yeah. It, it, all of life is there, you know, it's universal. And Harvard said a few years ago that the master of arts is the new MBA. So I would say, you know, I, I come across some people who haven't read a book, you know, for mm -hmm. 20 years, and it, it's a pity. You know, make sure you read fiction, mm -hmm. you read, you keep reading. Yeah. Thank so you. we'll get a, a list of books from you. Of course. My Thank pleasure. you so much. It Thank was you. lovely, you know, spending time with you. And you. Thank and you I'm, so much you. for listening to us. And uh, we hope to speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.